Um, I must say I was a little bit nervous about today um, as to what type of atmosphere would be here because I certainly know that the Vale family were looking for a celebration. And uh, when everyone came up the stairs, I realized that, relax, Gus, it's going to be a celebration. Um, a big welcome to everybody. Um, Olaf always knew how to draw a crowd. Um, today we celebrate a very, very, very special man um, and, and someone um, that's dear to all of us either as a friend, a colleague, a family member, an uncle, a father, a son, a very, very special man. I'd like to welcome um, everyone here today. Um, we have the DV, I mean, the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University, the DVCs, many of the deans, head of departments. We've got uh, visiting professors from Canada, um, from Leeds University, obviously from Zimbabwe, from Switzerland. Um, and that's not even the global community, that's online. Um, so welcome to everyone. Most importantly, welcome to the Vale family, uh, to Uli Gabi and the rest of the family, the riffraff of all of Olaf's daughters and uh, nieces um, who uh, are generally carrying on in the Vale way of uh, being disruptive, um, but, but that's fine. So you ask yourself, why are we here today? And the reason is that we all know two years ago, we had the devastating news of the loss of Olaf. And it was a very difficult time in the world. Um, we were in the midst of COVID. Um, we had a online funeral um, attended by hundreds of people around the world. But I think many of us felt that there was just a little bit left undone. It was felt that, you know, Olaf was such a special man that, that we, really, we, we needed to do something. And, and I know that certainly from the, from the person Olaf was, um, Michelle felt that. And then also from the academic side, you know, it was during COVID, we were trying to cope with COVID. We had to sort out his large post-grad school. Um, you don't have a man like Olaf leave us and not leave a massive hole. And really the last two years, we've been trying to, to, to live up to his legacy to make sure that everything gets done. Um, and today's a celebration. Today, we felt that today we're going to celebrate Olaf. That's why I'm so, so happy that everyone came up the, the stairs bouncing, um, which is really cool. That's what Olaf wanted. Um, certainly, um, one of the biggest things that Olaf would have done is he caused absolute havoc, havoc. I had numerous WhatsApp calls and phone calls. What do we wear? Um, and I said, well, I know what Olaf would have been in. Uh, Philip, stand up here. He would have been in the um, compulsory veil kit which is um, a shirt, uh, pants, and Olaf would have got his very newest crops out. I understand it's a new pair of crops that Phil's got. Um, and I try to think of Olaf in a suit or a tie, and it just, it just didn't happen, you know. And I think that speaks testament to, to Olaf. I think a lot of us learned a lot about Olaf in the last two years that we didn't know. Olaf wasn't the big flash guy. Oh, he was the big guy, but he wasn't the flash guy. Um, Olaf was just Olaf, uh, and I think that's what made him such an international, internationally recognized uh, scientist, made him build the teams he did, uh, made him make colleagues all around the world, attracted Grace postdocs. I mean, Olaf was just Olaf. Uh, you, you, you can't replace him. Um, and um, he would have rocked up in those um, because that's the way Olaf rolled. You know, um, he always walked up into my office whenever we had a meeting and I had my jacket on and he said, ah, the waiter again. Huh. <laughs> um, yeah, we, 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 we never suffered uh, much under Olaf. We suffered all the time under Olaf. Um, Olaf and his wit, um, his good humor, but also Olaf's empathy. Um, and this is all about who Olaf is, let alone Olaf's academic standing, which was absolutely outstanding. You know, over 250 papers, Ridiculous age factors, Saatchi chair, B rating. Olaf was taken before 50. There's no doubt in my mind that Olaf would have been an A-rated scientist. The funny thing is, I think he would have left before he got that. Um, I think he wanted to go and do stuff like in GTZ. Olaf always wanted to give back to the system. It wasn't about Olaf. It was what Olaf could give to the system. Certainly from my perspective um, as a managing director of SIAP, I couldn't ask for more in Olaf. Olaf was an absolutely outstanding chief scientist. He drove the science. He um, didn't take average. He pushed his students. He led from the front, um, but always with empathy. And most importantly, he was the son of Africa. He drove the transformation mandate. He brought in a sort of pan-African approach. 
Um, we will all know that Olaf had a little sweet spot for his Zimbabweans. Um, but really, he drove the whole the whole package. And, and that's a celebration. And that's what we want to celebrate today. We have um, a number of speakers, um, and they've been specifically chosen um, because they speak to Olaf's career. Um, and I'll introduce each one of them and, and why they were chosen. Um, and we'll go through that. And let's celebrate the big man. Um, he's, he's certainly with us every day. Um, Michelle was kind enough to give me a pair of his socks. I would never be able to fill his shoes, but I, I, I do wear his socks um, on the big occasions. So I've got them on today. You'll see they're a bit baggy. So whenever I've got a big meeting, particularly a science meeting, and I feel totally out of my depth because Olaf's not here, I put on Olaf's socks. And um, so Olaf's socks are with me. Um, so let's celebrate him. Um, the first speaker today um, is... Um, the indomitable uh, Professor Thomas Hecht, um, who um, was Olaf's supervisor, head of department, fellow German, so one could never get in that uh, little nexus they had there, you know. Um, and um, Olaf will be talking about Olaf's academic, I mean, Tom will be talking about Olaf's academic journey. Professor Hecht. Thank you, Angus. Uh, welcome to everybody and uh, welcome to all our international guests, wherever they are. Um, yeah, it is, uh, it feels good to be back in the bosom of uh, African ichthyology here in Makanda, um, where so many doyens of African ichthyology have made. They passed away on that fateful day in November 2020. Um, we must remember that uh, Olaf was and shall always be a feeling. Olaf is a feeling. And quite frankly, he was always a feeling. He still is that feeling. And I feel him right here. Um, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and let me give you a little story about... Uh, Olaf's, uh, <laughs> the time that I had with Olaf as a student, it was, it was, it was, it was great fun. But before we get there, I think uh, a singular privilege that any university professor has uh, is the opportunity to work with very bright young people, bushy-tailed, bright-eyed, full of brand new ideas, full of ambitions. Um, and it, 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 it really, it, it, it is really something fantastic. I'm sure that all the academics uh, here in this room and also elsewhere will agree that this is indeed a privilege. But every so often, a student arrives that uh, just makes that massive impression um, and has got all the attributes of becoming an excellent scholar. And Olaf certainly uh, was, was one of those. Um, yeah, and quite frankly, uh, I was the lucky guy that uh, he decided to come and study with after he did his honors degree. He came into my life in late November 1993. And uh, yeah, it was, it was quite a day. It was sort of end of the day, sun was going down, and uh, Olaf walked into the door and uh, the light faded. <laughs> he just took up that whole door. And uh, he says, uh, sorry to disturb you, Prof, but uh, is it okay if I come and do honors next year? I definitely will get first for zoology as well as for geography, so that should be all okay. Just tell me whether I can apply. I mean, what can you say? So I said, okay, uh, you, you can apply. And of course, he got firsts uh, for all his subjects. Um, and needless to say, yeah, two months later in February 1994, he joined the honors class. Um, 
Why does this thing not work? Did I? <laughs> Sorry, Des. Okay. So, observing Olaf in the honors class, uh, really, it, it, it was quite something to observe. Um, he was this big, bold, always cheerful, except when he was hungry. <laughs> then he got hangry, <laughs> seriously angry, clever, and within one week of, um, of, 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 of start of the honors class, he was appointed as the class captain uh, by his peers. Uh, and whatever, wh whatever you give Olaf to do, and here it, here it was his peers who gave him the job, listen, you're going to be class captain. He takes seriously, he always took things extremely seriously and gave his all uh, in order to make a success of this. And what was, what was a characteristic of his was when some of his peers started falling behind, you know, not managing to really get the essay in on time or not really understanding the mathematics of a model that... Uh, Tony Booth was, was, was talking about, and everybody was confused. Um, then Olaf would come in and grab those guys by the scruff of their necks and pull them along. And this is the beauty of the man. He, I am sure, contributed to the marks of very many of his peers being actually better than what they would have been if he had not been there. He really pulled them along. And uh, yeah, um, he would, he, sometimes he was like a mother hen, in fact, uh, caring and sharing, helping and supporting wherever he could. And needless to say, Olaf was uh, awarded the honors degree with, uh, with distinction. Yeah, I, this is direct quote. <laughs> This is direct quote. I killed myself laughing. Look at the, looking at all those potatoes, and he says, Ooh, "Your helpings are a bit small, my friend." <laughs> so yeah, this is eating canyenas in uh, uh, somewhere at the crossroad, going down to the lake. Um, Olaf, uh, during that honors year, uh, what 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 stood out uh, was was he was so curious. Um, he wanted to know what everybody in the department was doing. Um, and he would spend time talking to academic staff members and finding out more and more, what did they do? What, what, what are you doing? And, and then um, he then started participating in research projects of staff members. And that's how he got his first three papers. And make no mistake, he made a substantive contribution to those papers. He didn't just we didn't just add his name. It was sitting down and discussing the results of certain experiments where all us brilliance, even at that stage, came through and made his contribution and bingo, he was co-author of, uh, of, of a number of papers. In 1995, uh, he registered uh, for his master's degree after he got his honors. And his research topic was on developing uh, a sustainable multi-species, multi-gear model of, a, of, of, of Lake Chikamba in, 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 central, in central Mozambique. Um, yeah, in Manika province. And this was an intellectually challenging project. And uh, it was uh, something that he, that, he, that he did with absolute uh, he, was, he was like a bulldog. Uh, he'd grab hold of this subject. He knew it was difficult, but he also knew I'm going to crack this nut, and he did. And it was really wonderful uh, to see him uh, do his thing. Um, he was talented. He was so committed. Uh, what was always good going up there uh, and having time with, spending time with him in the field was that he was on top of the literature. He was, he was, he was really on top of it. And it was every single time I went up there, it was an intellectual 
wonderland where we spent time together just philosophizing late into the night of course helped with uh, with uh, with certain uh, amber liquids uh, but 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 um uh, yeah these things these 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 things uh, these things um yeah these things go together uh yeah, there was there were some 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 interesting anecdotes that one can tell about the time uh, in Lake Chikamba and working in the field with him. Nowadays, I think the university uh, or the deans, perhaps they would say, no ways you can't go and work in dangerous places like that. You would jeopardize the life of students. But in those days, things were slightly different. <laughs> so Olaf Olaf on his on 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 the, in the house where he lived, there was a big garden next to the lake. Um, with a fence around it, and as times were in those days, days there was a guarda. A guarda in Portuguese just simply means guard. And this guard had an AK-47 to guard the house. So one evening we came back from uh, um, Manica. There was a beautiful little piscina there. A piscina is a fish restaurant. And uh, Uli will recall it. Philip, you might recall it. Uh, delicious food, best seafood you can possibly imagine, hundreds of kilometers away from the sea. But nevertheless, the Portuguese, they know how to get seafood to wherever, and it's fresh and delicious. So we spent a long evening there, and we came back um, to the gate, and all are hooted for the guard to open the gate, but that didn't happen. So we got out of the car, and we found the guard fast asleep. So we looked at each other and all I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so we took the AK-47 and we fired a shot into the air. <laughs> well, to say the least, the guard fled, never to be seen nor heard of ever again. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, Olaf, uh, not only uh, was he a, a real intellectual scholar, uh, and a pleasure to work with. He was also an amazing cook um, and could rustle up the most delicious meal uh, wherever he was. And uh, yeah, and of course, an exceptional fisherman, as you saw, um, and a uh, party animal of note, uh, wonderful, wicked sense of humor, kind, compassionate, people-centric and respectful. And I think these characteristics are those that actually contributed to his making such a success of his career uh, once he started working at Rhodes and then ultimately at, at, at Syed. So after two years, uh, yeah, this is me fishing with the mafia boss. <laughs> you, I mean, you look at him. I mean, this is straight mafia. So um, um, after two years working with him, um, on the project uh, and having published some papers, uh, I thought to myself that uh, there is no ways that this guy um, is doing a master's here. He's already bu busy with a PhD. And it was very easy to convince uh, the board of the Faculty of Science to upgrade him to PhD, uh, which he did. And uh, he then continued to um, uh, complete his PhD. Um, and after his PhD, um, he was fortunate to be offered a position in Malawi as advisor and researcher at the Monkey Bay Fisheries Research Institute by the government of Malawi. And I think that was for him and Michelle one of the best times of their lives. Um, it was really fantastic. I visited them uh, a number of times, and uh, you, the meals that we had and the evenings that we had were absolutely uh, fantastic. But there again, I think that uh, it is during those four years that they spent there that Olaf again learned such a huge, uh, so much about how to work with people and get people behind them to follow. And 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 and. But it wasn't just a matter of Olaf leading; it was also. Olaf watching Olaf being able to work as, as, as a member of a team. He had, this, he had this gift to work as a member of a team, but also to take a team and lead it and run with it. So 
When the Malawi contract came to an end, I arranged a postdoc for him in the department next door. Um, through various ways, we managed to get that right, and he was there for one year. And whereafter, I retired, and he took he took over as senior lecturer in the vacated position that I left. Um, I had laid all sorts of plans, made all sorts of plans that Olaf would ultimately take over as head of department next door. But uh, all well laid plans <laughs> sometimes get <laughs> are thwarted. Uh, when in June 2009, he phoned me and he said, Tom, I'm so sorry. And I hope you're not going to be cross with me, but there's a position next door and I'm going to take the position next door, a senior scientist. I said, Olaf, you must go where your heart takes you. Go for it. I'm fully behind you. So he was he was very happy. He says, thanks, Tom, Tom. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it was, on, it was off desire. Um, now, let me give you a rapid summary of... Um, Olaf's positions. Um, this is these are not all by any means. This is just his academic career and uh, his uh, uh, early scientific career. I say early scientific career because Olaf never got into the middle of his scientific career and he never got into the end bit of his scientific career. So up until the day he died, he was still in those early stages of a career. But wow, what a career. So in uh, 94, he got his uh, BSc degree. Uh, you can see, I mean, right from the word go, he was the most outstanding zoo student in, in zoology, recognized by Rhodes, University, uh, by Rhodes University Award, and also by the Zoological Society of South Africa. Um, 95, he was awarded BSc honors with distinction. He was awarded the Sir Basil Shonland Scholarship. When I read his CV, he obviously made a mistake because in that CV, it says Sir Basil Schoonby Award. <laughs> and I thought, no, 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 this must be Shonland, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, I quickly corrected that for him posthumously. Um, so, yes, and he was also awarded uh, academic colors by, by the university. From 95 to 98, uh, he did his PhD, um, and then he was uh, stationed in Malawi uh, for the four years that I was talking about. Uh, he then did a postdoctoral research, uh, held a postdoc research fellowship in the DIFFS, um, and then was senior lecturer in the department, principal scientist, then Olaf and uh, Paul Cowley, uh, they were invited simultaneously by Rhodes Senate and Council to become honorary professors in the Department of Ichthyology and Fisheries Science. Uh, and in 27, he was awarded the South African Research Chair in Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology by NRF and Rhodes University. And that is straight, straight, straight a testimony to his excellence and uh, his stature within uh, the field of aquatic science, particularly, obviously, with a focus on fish and more so also with a focus on invasion biology. In 2018, he was promoted to chief scientist of SIAB until the sad day he died. But then things continued, and they have continued. In 2021, the American Fisheries Society established the Olaf Awards um, called Opportunity for Learning and Advancement in Fisheries in recognition of his contributions to freshwater fisheries uh, and biological research globally. So the man is still out there, he's still working, um, and accolades are still... Dennis, I don't want to blind you. There they are, the uh, brand new professors Weil and Cowley uh, in June 2015. Pussy tailed, bright eyed. Yeah. Um, 
Apart from the fact that he held a professorship at Rhodes University and also through SIAB, he also had held professorships at the University of Toronto and Scarborough, where Nick is from, uh, and an adjunct professorship at the University of Nebraska. I think, am I correct? Yes. And he was a core team member of the NRF uh, Center for Excellence in Invasion Biology at Stellenbosch. Olaf certainly established himself as a leading scientist uh, within his field. Um, as Olaf, as, as Gus said earlier on, I mean, uh, the postgraduate school that, uh, that he had established around him uh, and his team of students and co-workers, it was a dynamic force. And uh, thank goodness he established that here, not when I was in the DERFs. I don't know how Gus managed it, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a forceful uh, uh, unit that uh, Olaf had, had established here. Um, yeah, during his, uh, um, I would say, short academic career, Olaf has published over 200, some say 250, some say 260 peer-reviewed papers. I'm not sure how many, but the hell of a lot than what I published in my career. And I published quite a bit, but uh, I'm sure that very many papers will still follow and will still have his name uh, on them because of the seminal role that he played during the initiation of very many projects that are still running today and also his contributions to those particular projects. So Olaf's uh, name in publications, we will still see it for many years to come. I would say that, uh, Yeah, this is, uh, 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 I can tell the story as well, because the people aren't here. Um, so um, we were hungry, we were working, there was no meat, there was no nothing for three or four days. So Olaf and I, we decided, and we had Maura Andrew with us, and Olaf and I decided we'll get a goat. And uh, we uh, all up negotiated and chose and purchased a goat, the one little one standing in front of him. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, 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 we took this goat and we had it in the back of our land cruiser on the way back to Chenna Chenna, our station, where we were based. Um, and on the way back, this goat was going meh, meh, in, in the back of the cruiser. And uh, Morris says, no ways are you guys killing this goat and eating it. Listen to it. Uh, well, we, we, we got back and uh, by that stage, Maura had uh, made her case very solidly and there was no ways that we were going to do it. So what we did is we tied the goat on the back leg of the goat and we tied that rope onto a tree. The tree was right outside Maura's bedroom window. <laughs> and that night, our goat was mad, mad. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, uh, well, Maura didn't sleep too well. <laughs> and in, in the morning, she said, please slaughter the goat. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that night, we ate like things. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I would say that. Um, Olaf himself, in terms of the fact, well, he was an invasive invasion biology person, uh, but I must say he was an invasive character himself. He invaded my heart. Um, he invaded the hearts of very many people where he still is. Um, and um, yeah, I think that the international freshwater fish community has lost one of its leading lights. And the Grahamstown Theological community has lost one of its famous sons. Thank you. The GC stories will come out tonight. <laughs> um, thanks, Tom. Um, 
a very good testament to Olaf. Um, the next speaker, unfortunately, can't be with us. Um, we all know that um, Olaf had a very soft spot for his uh, Zimbabwean students. Um, and uh, Taku uh, received his PhD under Olaf's supervision. Uh, also won a number of different um, um, awards, including the NRF, um, including the NRF uh, Young Researcher Award, um, as well as a number of other um, presentation awards like Fame Lab and those aspects. So, an outstanding young man. Unfortunately, uh, in Zimbabwe at the moment with with visa issues, um, but we do have a, a presentation um, that has been pre-recorded. Nikki, you going to do that? Hi, everyone. In remembering Olaf, I will be reflecting on my PhD journey from when I joined Olaf's research group at SIAP to the present. My name is Takuzo Comfort Matsivanzira. I was born in a small town called Chegutu in Zimbabwe. And growing up, I wanted to be a chief justice, but I ended up wearing the wrong red gown. <laughs> I did animal science at BSc and tropical resource ecology at masters. I started volunteering at the University of, um, University of Zimbabwe Lake Kariba Research Station up to 2018 when I got recruited by none other than the father of chaos, Olaf Bayo. He was the father of chaos because our group was undefined, chaotic, diverse, but very united and highly productive. So in joining the research group, I was to work on crayfish research in Africa, supervised by Olaf himself and Josie. Reflecting on my PhD, Olaf and Josie gave me a clear direction in as to what needed to be done and what the project wanted to achieve. Despite the instructions being clear, to, to Olaf, I appeared as this playful, naughty idiot who was going to mess up the project. And of course, as a student, you have situations where you sometimes mess up, but in most situations, I would prove him wrong and this would annoy him. <laughs> you then hear him talking to Josie in the office saying, Surprisingly, Mr. Matsuanzira has written something really, really good. <laughs> and they would laugh and call me in the office and tell me that, um, Taku, your work is rubbish. And I would put a worried face and you would be like, relax, relax, Mr. Matsuanzira. I'm just messing with you. Your work is really good. Let's just address a few issues and let's send it away. That is what he used to say. So my PhD work looked at crayfish invasions in Africa to determine their potential impacts on ecosystems and socioeconomic livelihoods. Information on crayfish invasions in Africa was scant and we needed to provide information on where those crayfishes are, where they're heading to, and their devastating ecological and socioeconomic impacts. So further details about my research, it is a presentation for another day. I just want to focus more on how I excelled because of all of For my PhD, I can testify that I am an exhibition of Olaf's magnificent supervision and mentorship. Olaf had amazing collaborators from students and networks that were really helpful for my PhD. Going to Zambia, there was Bruce Ellender, Marchaya, and the fisheries team, especially in the town of Mongu, who all knew Olaf. The first time that me and Craig went to Zambia, as we introduced ourselves as all of students at SIAP, they'll be like, oh, boys, welcome. How is that big Mzungu? <laughs> because of all of collaboration and relationship with these fisheries guys, government officials and representatives in different countries, 
our work would go on smoothly without any administrative and country specific challenges. In Namibia, there was Francois Jacobs and uh, Mr. Kibab. In Zimbabwe, there was Tamuka Niwatiwa. In Malawi, there were the fisheries guys where you previously worked. And in South Africa, I cannot even exhaust his list of networks that were really helpful for my PhD work. His international friends, um, Anthony Ricciardi, Jamie Dick, Nick Mandrak, um, Anna Nunes, Jean Bitule, Hugh MacIsaac, Michelle Jackson, among others, were really helpful. I completed my PhD in two years, six months, with five publications. As you can see from, um, from these two pictures, this was at the beginning of the PhD when I was ambitious and when things were looking really good. And this was at the end of the PhD when I had deteriorated. <laughs> so much work came out of this PhD thesis as well as crayfish invasions in Africa work that we embarked on. Um, the following examples are the publications that we um, that were research outputs from the work. The effect of prey identity and substrate type on the functional response of a globally invasive crayfish. And a big review that has been widely referenced and cited, a review of special crayfish introductions in Africa. And mechanisms behind potential biotic resistance toward two invasive crayfish by native pressure that crabs. Invasive crayfish outperform crabs at higher temperatures. Standardization of alien invasive Australian red claw crayfish sampling gear in Africa. And this gear that we determined is now widely being used um, in Southern Africa for crayfish surveys. The distribution and establishment of the Australian red claw crayfish in the Zambezi Basin. And here we did surveys in Zimbabwe, Zambia, um, is, um, Botswana, and Namibia to determine where those crayfishes are and uh, potential areas that uh, could be invaded in the near future. And experiments to determine the ecological and potential socioeconomic impacts of two globally invasive crayfish. And the recent work that we did to help people to mitigate against the socioeconomic impacts associated with crayfish invasions. It was really, really sad that um, just before before I could submit my thesis, it is the month that Olaf sadly passed. It was a very difficult time for us, his chaotic group, but I was fortunate because Olaf had seen all of my chapters and had said that December we will be submitting and he was happy. Everyone was broken, but um, thanks to Angus, uh, Josie South, Josie Pegg, Paul, Vanessa, Bruce Albert, um, Francesca, um, Nanisqua, Sislula, Malfedi, uh, Gat, and many others, friends and um, family who really were there for us and ensured that we managed to finish our problems. Because of all of I boast having the following awards accolades and uh, prizes. Best PhD presentation at the Zoological Society of Southern Africa Conference in 2019. Best top six poster at the American Fisheries Conference in 2020. Best students presentation Rose three-minute thesis competition 2020 and 
Rhodes University representative at the national competition, which I then won. <laughs> and after all of learned that I had won a national competition. He was so charmed and um, because Rhodes University had participated in this competition for the first time ever and I won it. So the whole top admin of Rhodes from the vice chancellor himself were congratulating Olaf and that was on the 13th of November 2020. It was on a Friday. A day after, that is on the 14th, as we were still celebrating, all those great news um, were cut, um, the celebrations were cut short as all have sadly passed the following day. After all of passing, awards and accolades kept on coming. I won the best student presentation at the SIAB Student Symposium in 2020. I was also the SIAB Student of the Year in 2020. In 2021, I got the NRF Research Excellence Award for Next Generation Researchers. I was awarded the bronze medal at the Sussex conference in 2022. And I won the second best presentation at the second international young research conference on invasive species in 2022. All these awards, I won them because I had the best mentorship from Olaf and Josie. What annoyed Olaf, I enjoyed annoying Olaf a lot. <laughs> what annoyed him was that I uh, would do all this behind his back. And then people would then come to Olaf and say, oh, Olaf, congratulations. Your boy is the national champion. And he would come to me jokingly threatened um, to beat me up with electricity <laughs> cables, just like our former first lady, Grace Mugabe. Oh, let me up in a room full of owls and pets because he knew what I feared the most. <laughs> Olaf wasn't just like an ordinary supervisor to me. He knew about my family, my background, and in times of need, he would uh, bail me out financially with his own personal money. Olaf would allow me um, to go for, to, to do any extra co-curricular activities. I myself, I'm an athlete and I play volleyball. He would allow me and Nomisa was also, who was also in our research group and played netball for Rhodes to go for sporting tournaments, matches, which at times ran for several days to a week. His understanding for extra co-curricular activities were because he also played rugby for Rods and during his days, they always lost and anyone who knows about the Rhodes rugby team, nothing has changed up to this present day. The team is still being beaten by its opponents. I'm so grateful to the files, uh, Michelle, Uli, Gabby, Michael, uh, to mention just a few. With Michael, at one point we were um, doing our field work in Namibia and Olaf came to join us. After his two weeks visit, uh, me and Craig, we went to drop Olaf and Josie in, Ma in Mount Botswana so that he catches a flight back to South Africa. So when we dropped them at Mark Air, uh, that is owned by Michael, Michael asked, so what are these two boys doing for the rest of the day here in Mount? All of trying to avoid embarrassments in whatsoever way, um, he always assumed that me and Craig, we are always up to no good. He quickly dismissed Michael and said that, now those boys are just going to hang around town wherever I don't care and head back to Namibia. 
Then Michael was like, boys, come around 1 p.m. I will put you in one of my flights that is going into the Okavango Delta to drop my clients. Olaf, seeing that he has lost, he came to us in a low tone voice, not wanting to be heard by anyone other than me and Craig and said that, please, please sit at the back of the plane <laughs> and please don't puke. <laughs> it was really funny, but um, we had an amazing experience flying over the beautiful Okavango Delta. And such an opportunity is really rare to get because, um, but because of Olaf and uh, the love that the Vile family has towards us, we had um, the best experience ever. Coming to Olaf's father, Uli, uh, Grumpy Uli, um, and Debbie. <laughs> They are really amazing grandparents, I would call them. Um, they check on me almost every day. <laughs> Hi, Taku, how are you doing? I know you're stressed about the visa issue. Please come and visit us. Tell us if you need um, if you need fuel or we'll see what we can do. They're really amazing. Um, I sometimes uh, visit them when they're in Harare and we share a lot of Olive's memories and they tell me about their experiences in Southern Africa. I will end this presentation uh, by thanking everyone listening. Um, I would also want to thank Gabby and Oli for bringing all of on this app who miserably uh, contributed to many people's lives and I am a testimony of his amazing mentorship. To you, Olaf, um, wherever you are, thank you for everything. We never got the chance to appreciate you, but um, your, your legacy will forever live in us. May your soul continue to rest in peace. <laughs> As you can see, the excellence coming through in Olaf's group. Um, I'm just wondering about um, the adherence to the time limit. But um, um, anyway, I won't uh, argue with the award winners. Um, certainly, Taku, amazing young man. We're desperately trying to get him out of Zimbabwe at the moment with visa issues. Um, but we will eventually get him down and make sure that he has a space within our system. The next speaker um, is Dr. Josie South, who was one of uh, Olaf's senior postdocs. As you can see, she was very involved in, in Tucker's PhD. She's now a lecturer at the University of Leeds. Um, sadly, through all of this, she was stuck in England when, when Olaf passed, um, a very trying time, um, and also lost her father, um, which was very tough for her. Um, so Josie is going to speak on Olaf's influence on African invasion biology and ecology, um, and certainly um, one of Olaf's top producing postdocs, um, and she set the bar very high. I see she's missing up already, so good luck. <laughs> um, although she's a bit wee, she's uh, dynamite. So um, over to uh, Josie. Thank you, Angus. Uh, and that's traditional. <laughs> so I was given the task of trying to summarize Olaf's contributions to the field of aquatic invasion sciences. This is really hard. I, I'm going to go through exactly why, but while I was doing so, what I realized was Olaf did very, very well in managing to combine all of his favorite things, fish, fishing, eating fish, traveling to look at other fish, and also people, especially people that really like fish. So... My initial thing was, let me go on to Olaf's Google Scholar. Let me understand exactly how much he's done. So this is an extraordinary amount of citations. And actually, his top three cited publications, they're all invasion science publications. These are massive, massive pieces of work. So the other thing to notice is these papers are all from 2022. As a posthumous researcher, Olaf is more productive than half of the people in this room. It's 
this, this is something that would undoubtedly give him like a huge amount of glee. I, I know somewhere he's telling everyone about this. This is going to bring him a lot of pleasure. So I went back to the very beginning. Um, as you can see, Tom features here. Olaf's initial publications were kind of sporadic, the ones that involved invasion ecology. But what they did involve was a lot of large mouth bass. Why isn't this working? There we go. <laughs> As I'm sure you all know, Olaf really loved fishing. Olaf really loved bass. Whenever I think of Olaf, I think of him holding up a massive bass. So much, in fact, that I put him in a book recently, just so he stays there and everyone knows. So Olaf's work on bass, he managed to combine his absolute love of fishing and combining his job with his hobby with anything else that he could kind of fit in. Some might say it was a scam. Some might say that he managed to do it perfectly. But he managed to go fishing and also managed to publish. Insane. So from 1999 to around 2008, the publications on invasion ecology, they were quite sporadic. They were patchy. It's mainly because he seems to have been running around Malawi having a nice time. Um, However, from about 2010, these publications increased massively in volume. So part of this was due to, in, where are we? In 2011, Olaf was invited to join the Center for Invasion Biology. He was nominated by Paul Skelton on account of him being exceedingly interesting and ambitious, and one of the few people working in Southern Africa in aquatic invasion ecology. Through the CIB, Olaf had 16 postgraduate students and at least four CIB postdocs. This is part of the network that allowed Olaf to grow massively in both his academic pursuits, but also his social capital, his social pursuits. Olaf just liked talking about science with his friends. So I'm going to very, very quickly give you a whistle-stop tour through some of the more interesting publications and how they link into Olaf's interactions with his students. So one of his first big publications was this on the African sharp tooth catfish. This was a passion that Olaf had throughout his work. In fact, one of the first things that he said when I walked in, he's like, what do you want to work on? What do you like? I was like, I don't know. I've seen those big, dirty catfish. I was like, yeah, I love those. Come with me. And like, took me immediately to the fish farm around the corner. He's like, look at all of these fish. What do you want? You can have them. I was like, okay, blimey. Um, so... He started looking at the processes of how invasions actually occur. And during this, he became a bit obsessed with the Sunday's River impoundments. He would take everyone that visited up to the Sunday's River, say, look at my ponds. Look at the things I can do in these ponds. Um, part of his interest in the sharp tooth catfish also led to his collaborations abroad, particularly in Brazil with Jean Vatule. This is something that has been carried on throughout his career. So from the Sunday's ponds, once he realized the potential, and for, for context, these, these are very ugly, dirty little ponds. These aren't exciting systems. These are a series of ponds in the Sunday's River Valley, and Olaf was so excited by the potential of this. So much, in fact, that now permanent scientist at Saab, Dr. Lubomofu, his PhD was based entirely in the Sunday's River, looking at how we can use these systems to understand colonization processes and exactly what was going on in there. As you can see, Luba was also part of the CIB and won a prize. As you can see, a very blurry Olaf was very happy. And um, some more work from Dara Woodford in the same system. Dara was a postdoc with the CIB and Olaf also. Uh, a lot more publications came out looking at how we can predict risk, how we can predict which species are going to come into the system and what we can do about it. These publications are massive international collaborations. This shows all of standing in the invasion community, which is fairly cliquey, but it's very, very global. And Olaf was up there in every single one of them. These papers were, especially this Journal of Applied Ecology paper, it is one of the top five most downloaded papers in the entire journal's history. 
So a bit more back to the bass. Something that Olaf really liked doing was one, catching fish, bringing them back to the lab. Then he has fish in the lab to look at and to tell people to go and play with. But he also likes catching fish out in the wild, running around in the field and having a good time. So a skill that I learned from Olaf is how to make things scalable. We can do it in the lab and then we'll do it again in the field. And then you just double up the amount of time you have actually playing with fish. <laughs> A neat project Olaf had was with a um, now professor at Oxford, Michelle Jackson, another postdoc from the Centre for Invasion Biology, is looking at this trophic overlap between fish and riparian spiders. This was kind of a neat project, in my opinion. It also shows Olaf also loved playing with trout. Right? This is something that I'm going to come back to. So here's another paper with Jeremy Shelton in the Cedarburg, looking at how trout can negatively affect the native endemic fishes, and how this is related to a temperature threshold. Again, Olaf had lots of fun running around the Cedarberg chasing trout. As we know, that is what he was doing on the day that he died, and this is a permanent testament to how much he liked doing his job. So yeah, Olaf loved trout, and he spent a lot of time chasing trout, I believe, this is somewhere in the States, another picture is somewhere in Canada, and another picture in Highlands Lodge in South Africa. Olaf knew that the key and the novel entry point to invasive species work was incorporating people. This is what he liked to look at, the way people interact with nature and what we can do about them. As Angus said, Olaf really wants to be able to give back to the system, to understand the human dynamics and the human aspects of the stuff that he was doing. It's not just an ecological network, it was a human network, and that's something that he always maintained with us. Olaf did a lot of work looking at how invasive species actually give benefit to humans, how the societies can use those. This was in part due to his avid angling obsession, and he knew that. To look at invasive species that are sport fish, you need to understand anglers. The problem was that anglers often didn't understand Olaf. <laughs> there was a very, very, uh, well, Olaf talked about it all of the time. It was a, quite a negative article. And trust me, I've searched all over the place. And if someone has a copy of this article, I would very much like it. Where... After Olaf's work looking at policy and trout and how the naturalization process works in Nember, the angling trout lobby, they, they, they wrote this really negative article saying, you know, this guy, whatever. And I can't actually remember the specific words they used, but Olaf would always tell people with absolute delight, they called me a witch. They called me a witch. And this would inevitably roll into a Monty Python witch sketch where Olaf would try and say, yes. But do I weigh the same as very small rocks? And only about 50% of the people would understand what he was talking about. But it would be belligerent. So all else work from this, this worked directly into policy, as well as him making another excuse to visit all of the perfect angling spots in the country and elsewhere. Um, again, this paper by Dara Woodford and Olaf and a large international cohort this is one of the top papers ever downloaded in Neobiota. It took me a little bit of scrolling to find these things, but Olaf's name is at the top of all of them. Here is Olaf after a very, very rough night presenting on his work on conflict species at the Sambi Invasion Symposium. Olaf the night before had uh, got a bit lost after one too many and walked the complete opposite direction across a field. We had to run after him, direct him back to his tent. Go that way, please. You can't sleep it. The next morning, it's like huffing and puffing. It's like, everyone's like, are you okay? Is, is there something wrong? It's like, no, no, no. The little one was doing it and I thought it was safe and I'm not very well. <laughs> As I said, Olaf's favorite things, fish, fishing, eating fish, traveling, and talking to people who also like fish. This has given this amazingly huge human network. And that's something that I think everyone who's come out of Olaf's group and has interacted with him, that's something that they've always maintained. Olaf had this amazing way of bringing people together and holding people together. 
And that's something that even without Olaf and even during COVID, we still managed to get together to toast him and to show what he represented. It's been an absolute honor being able to work with Olaf. I think my time was very lucky with him, especially as my job interview, I had no idea it was a job interview. It involved him saying, do you like fish and how do you cope in the heat? And then me saying, sorry, I don't really understand what's going on here. It's like, oh no, it's fine. You can have the job. <laughs> and I'm kind of blinking at him. It's like, who is this enormous man offering me a job out of nowhere? It's like, what is the job, please? Before, before I say, sure, I ran away to South Africa and said, it doesn't matter. I've got loads of money. You can, you can work it out when you get here. <laughs> and to be fair, it worked out perfectly. Thank you very much. Indeed, Olaf did have a lot of money uh, because he made a habit of spending mine before his. Um, the, um, and all of that comes out the wash when you've got to tidy up. Um, and um, indeed, he did have a lot of money. Um, the other thing with Olaf was um, he would come to me, he'd be saying, going somewhere, and he'd say, um, yeah, and I'd say, work or play. And he says, is there a difference? <laughs> um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Nicholas Mandrak, who came out from Canada, um, who will speak about Olaf's uh, international standing and collaborations. Well, it's an honor to be here to talk about my friend and colleague. And uh, when we flew into uh, Port Elizabeth, it reminded me of the very first time that uh, I met Olaf. He had uh, invited us to, uh, a few of us from Canada, we were going to a CIB um, meeting in, in Stellenbosch uh, because I was part of a Canadian aquatic invasive species network that was sort of the parallel to CIB. Uh, he invited us to come out beforehand and visit and said, we, I think we have some things in common. We get to Port Elizabeth Airport. I'm like, I, I've never met Olaf before. I, am I going to recognize him? And before I could even get that out, of course, he comes bounding in. Hi, welcome, welcome, and picks up our luggage and off we go, right? And um, that was uh, 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 just uh, almost immediately, I felt like I, I've, I've met my twin, right? And I don't know, let me see. And, you know, obviously there is some resemblance in physical stature. <laughs> and the other day, um, Michelle asked, uh, how did you fit in cars together? And I recounted a time when we had a Clio and I, we were literally, our shoulders were touching, right? And I, I felt like we were driving in a clown car, right? <laughs> but, you know, that, that's a very, very superficial uh, way in which we, we were similar to one another. Um, you know, we, we, we both had two daughters. You know, uh, we both have cabins and love being out at the cabin and, and uh, the, the, well, here's, you know, Olaf's um, home habitat, the braai. Uh, mine is the barbecue, right? Of course, we love good food and drink. And here we are at Cannon Rocks in 2020, uh, uh, feasting on the oysters that we had harvested. And uh, of course, we like, we love fishing and Yes, um, Olaf always outfished me. Uh, we're fishing here at Cannon Rocks. I think he caught six to every one one of the fish that I caught. And here's a bass that I caught with him when he was fishing with me in uh, in Canada. And, uh, you know, fishing's one thing, but of course, we're passionate about fishes, right? And, and the diversity of fishes. And uh, I think uh, we we... We shared uh, a, a, you know, a common passion for uh, academic mentorship. And I, I sort of found, found it uncanny that we have parallel pictures of our labs, right? Uh, you know, there, there's the, you know, and we're both at the back because our students are up in the front, right? And I had to show you another one because, again, uncanny. Here's a here's a second picture of our lab of us with our labs, and in fact, Olaf's in the one with my lab uh, in uh, a wilderness area north of Toronto, Algonquin Park. Now, um, I, I, in terms of research, again, 
uh, uncannily similar. We're, we're both national experts on in fish biodiversity and fish invasion, invasions. We were keenly interested in the applied side of fishes and fisheries, particularly the social economic issues that, that um, drive uh, uh, modern fisheries. Um, we had large research labs with PDFs and graduate students. Uh, we just could not say it a good idea, uh, no to good ideas and enthusiastic or passionate students. And Tom had mentioned that earlier. Uh, and as I found out uh, the other day talking to Angus, we were both creative budgeters, uh, where we were very good at hiding money and making sure if that right student came along, we had plenty of money for them. Uh, you know, based on our, uh, Josie brought up this, this paper, and this was the first paper that, um, that Olaf and I collaborated on, and it came out of that 2013 meeting in, uh, in Stellenbosch. And we co-authored the um, the rainbow the invasive rainbow trout uh, case study within the paper because Olaf likes to fish for rainbow trout and and that, although that's not Olaf but likes to fish for rainbow trout in South Africa I like to fish for rainbow trout in North America we're like oh we can write a paper on you know what we like to do uh, recreationally as well as academically so I. I really enjoyed that first uh, experience of uh, working with Olaf and realized, hey, we we sort of gel. We get along. We could really work together. Um, and uh, at that point, we decided that we would work together and that we actually um, uh, co-supervised uh, several graduate students uh, who worked both in, in South Africa and North America. Uh, thanks for showing this, uh, Josie, because again, uh, how similar Olaf and I are. Uh, here's mine. Here's Olaf's H index. Both have an index of 47. Uh, you know, and uh, so uh, it's remarkably remarkable how similar our, our careers have been uh, on, on, you know, what, 10,000 kilometers apart. Now, um, I, I'll do need to talk a little bit about his international collaborations. And, and I recounted my own personal experience with Olaf. And I know I've talked to his other collaborators who had very, had very similar experiences. And it was about the connection made with Olaf, right? And first and foremost, the personal connection. And then, you, then the, the academic uh, collaboration, uh, this naturally flows from that. And uh, th these are the uh, countries in which uh, Olaf had uh, collaborators that I know of, and I know I, that I'm missing some. And uh, if we just do an overview of uh, his international collaborations and standing, at least a quarter of his papers were on international topics. Uh, he he um, uh, gave invited lectures on four continents. He was an, uh, an associate editor for four international journals, reviewer for 25 plus international journals, uh, the regional chair for Southern Africa uh, in the freshwater fishes uh, specialist group of the IUCN, and uh, the lead author on an international um, assessment report on invasive alien species. And, and there's much more. These, these are just some of the highlights. And uh, I did, uh, when, when I was preparing this talk, I did uh, just ask him of his international colleagues to send me a few words. And uh, I've, I've edited them down because uh, I asked for a couple of sentences, ask an ac academic for a couple of sentences. I got a couple of pages from most and uh, I edited them down to what I thought were the, the take home message from, from each one of them. Uh, Mike, Mike Allen from University of Florida, you know, and, and this is a recurring theme was, you know, the biggest thing he remembers is joy right and uh and just uh being with students the joy of uh, being in the field fishing being with students Hugh McIsaac uh here we are actually in 2013 at that first meeting um educating and entertaining uh and uh was always active participating in in the sampling and uh his knowledge of uh, fish was immense and he enjoyed a cold beer afterwards, uh, perhaps more than one. And I, I, I've, I've been part of that, but I, not to the point that uh, Josie uh, outlined the earlier. 
And uh, Leo, here we are um, after the um, uh, the Sasqua meeting in 2018 uh, at Cannon Rocks. And uh, Leo actually wrote quite a lengthy, interesting um, uh, um, email. That I, I thought the, the the first line could have been uh, a, the start of a, no a really interesting novel, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, and this. We immediately took a liking to each other and, and started talking fish. That was it. I, I think that's the common thread across all of the collaborators, right? And then uh, uh, they were both involved in this um, South Africa Netherlands research project um, and others. And uh, Tony Tony Ricciardi, um, you know, uh, talking about. Uh, really, the breadth the the breadth of uh, Olaf's interests. It wasn't just fishes; he also worked on crayfishes and and other species. And uh, Dr. Vituli from Brazil uh, again uh, uh, sent quite a bit of information, and I distilled it down to: uh, my friend Olaf has been the most important person to date in my career in many ways. I'm always so grateful for your generosity and bright brain. Another reoccurring uh, theme, the brightness and the, the, the sharpness and the wit of uh, Olaf. Uh, I miss our laughs and discussions about science, always with good ideas during good and fun fishing. Again, reoccurring theme. And I just want to talk about, just for a minute, uh, what I think is probably the seminal, the seminal international uh, paper that um, Olaf has been involved in, research that's been involved in. Uh, Olaf was involved in the eradication of uh, an invasive species from uh, a system in, in the, the Cedarberg. And this, is, this rarely is successful. And this may be one of the first and best examples of a successful eradication. Uh, so it's in the Rondegut, uh, in the Cedarberg, and Olaf um, authored the, the original paper in an international journal of fisheries. And then uh, the, the, the graduate student that we co-supervised, uh, Rashir Castaneda, uh, did some follow-up analysis of the data uh, that was collected. And um, well, there's uh, Rashir's paper. Um, and this is the system. Basically, the system uh, is is this beautiful river with a series of natural waterfalls and then a dam going into Clan William Dam and bass were moving up the system and um, errat totally eradicating these highly endangered fishes uh, in the system. Uh, so the idea was to remove the bass from the system. And uh, what you can see, and I don't want to, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I don't want to get into too much uh, detail here, but between here and here is, this is where you see the native species. There's this waterfall that prevents the bass from getting any further upstream. And all you have below is bass and all those native species are gone. And then at, one year after treatment, you see that uh, the native species are starting to recolonize the area. It, absolutely incredible groundbreaking work. And then uh, when we looked, uh, Further, further along the timeline, a few more years of data, um, you see that the, the native fishes are really uh, recovering in that area. Again, uh, this is a seminal uh, paper uh, or, and, and research project in terms of the eradication of invasive fishes. This has rarely been done anywhere in the world. And just the last uh, couple of uh, slides here. Um, you know, this is a, a seminal paper that Olaf wrote uh, just before he passed in, in uh, for South Africa. All right, it's setting the, the 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 future research agenda to support fisheries management in South Africa. Uh, he was invited to give a plenary at the World Fisheries Congress that was to be held in 2020. And in fact, that picture of uh, um, Olaf and me fishing at Cannon Rocks was, we were actually having the discussion of what his plenary should be. And I said, well, of course, this new paper that's just coming out, it's such an important paper. 
And he said, oh, well, I'm going to do that. Unfortunately, he never had a chance uh, to give that plenary, but I was invited to give it on his behalf, and I was honored to do so in 2021 when the Congress was eventually held. And um, uh, in 2022, we had the opportunity to meet in person, and we had a, um, a special session to, uh, as, as a tribute to Olaf at the 2022 International Conference on Aquatic Invasive Species in Belgium. And um, like today, that was a, I think it really helped us move towards, you know, healing and feeling, you know, being together in person um, to, to celebrate Olaf, right? And again, another one of his favorite habitats, right? And uh, we just, we had a wonderful dinner and, and beers and it was a, it was a wonderful um, uh, session. And I'll point out that the, um, the, the, uh, the conference uh, provided uh, several travel scholarships for several of Olaf students to attend and present in the session. And um, the the tributes keep coming because this is uh, this is occurring right now. This is the the Great Lakes of the World Conference, the tenth one, uh, and it's currently being held in Tanzania. And one of the plenaries uh, was actually dedicated to the memory of Olaf, and this was just two days ago. Uh, so of course, Olaf's influence is global and ongoing and will uh, be so going into the future. And uh, again, uh, we already heard about, who has an award named after just the first name? And you know exactly who it is, right? And uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, Olaf was the, the president of the International Fishery Section, and uh, it, they've honored him with this Olaf Award. And I will end there. Thank you. We uh, we honored to have Dr. Clifford Momani here, a graduate of SIAB, um, and he's the deputy CEO of the NRF. I'd just like to point out, Clifford, that we don't bill for the beers, okay? Um, we under strict regulations, the PFMA, so um, we, we, we pay for our own beers. Um, the next speaker is Josie Pegg, uh, another one of the the, the two Josies. Uh, unfortunately, Josie can't be here. She's up at Sand Park, so I think uh, getting washed away at the moment um, in terms of the Kruger uh, at the Kruger Park. And Josie uh, played a pivotal role also in, in pulling everything together um, um, at the end, and she'll be giving a presentation on um, the Saatchi legacy and all of students. Good morning from a very wet Kruger National Park. I am very sorry that I can't join you in person in Makanda today, but I want to say thank you to Uli, to Syab, and to all Olaf's friends for inviting me to talk today. At the time of Olaf's death, he held the DSI NRF South African Research Chair in Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology and had 15 postgraduate students under his supervision. I asked them what they wanted to say about Olaf's work, and many mentioned that he was a brave scientist. He gave chances to projects and people. Every one of those students has graduated or will graduate or submit this year. And I think they are the ones who are very brave. In the midst of a global pandemic with everyone's research impacted, to lose a supervisor like Olaf and to pick themselves up and carry on is an enormous achievement. So with many omissions that you must forgive, I hope you enjoy this update of their work, their lives and Olaf's legacy. The aim of the South African Research Chair in Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology was firstly to develop internationally competitive science 
resulting in a higher level of understanding of biological and ecological processes in African freshwater fisheries to inform ecologically, economically and socially sustainable fisheries resource use. Although Olaf didn't live to see the publication of the government's National Freshwater Wild Capture Fisheries Policy, his work in the 20 years prior is apparent throughout this document including the seminal 10 questions paper published just a few days after his death and authored by national and international experts, as well as his own students. The second aim of the chair was to develop regional capacity in inland fisheries and freshwater ecology, aligned to transformation and redress in the science sector. And that's where his students came, come in. I'll start with Manetsi, a co-author on the 10 questions paper. Manetsi graduated in 2022 with a PhD in zoology from the University of Fort Hare. Manetsi studied the aspects of the ecology of the estuarine round herring, Gilchristella asturia, Astur and its small scale fishery potential. He has so far published three papers from that PhD with two more in review. Manetsi is now working as a lecturer at Bindura University of Science Education in Zimbabwe. Peter Swanepoel is another of Olaf's PhDs working in small scale fisheries potential, in this case of Hrit Dam, South Africa's largest impoundment. This picture shows Peter demonstrating his catch to two very important special guests. He's continuing this work as a researcher for the Free State Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Mm. Olaf wasn't a parasitologist at heart, but he had an opinion and a lot of questions about all things fish, which led to his supervision of Marlies our vile lab parasitologist. She completed both her PhD and her MSc with Olaf and has published seven papers from this work. She's presently a postdoctoral researcher at SciLab and Northwest University working on the Refresh project, which aims to provide a fresh and updated look into the freshwater biology, biodiversity South Africa focusing on seven taxonomic groups. During her studies, Marlies has won several prestigious awards, including the Senior W. O. Neitz Medal Award from the Parasitological Society of Southern Africa for the best PhD thesis in parasitology, as well as the Angela Davis Russell Award for outstanding research outputs in 2021. Casey is another of Olaf's PhD graduates who studied the Cape Fold ecoregion fish community ecology in responses to stresses. He has published two papers from this work with two further in review and is now an intern in the City of Cape Town graduate internship program in conservation and fauna management and is busy, busy, busy publishing yet more papers. Himurama completed her MSc under Olaf's supervision using baited remote underwater video systems to look at conservation of a popular aquarium species in Lake, Moor, Lake Malawi. She has one paper from this work in review and another ready to go. She's currently working as an environmental science intern at SRK Consulting in Johannesburg. Craig Rennie completed his MSc through Rhodes University on the diversity and dry season habitat associations of fish communities in the Kabompo River Basin in Zambia. He has two papers in prep and now works as a consultant for aquatic ecosystem services. 
Dina completed her thesis titled Biology and Movement Patterns of Non-Native Common Carp in Hrunfle. She has superb paper in review and is now chosen to stay with us at SIAB and is a PhD student working with the Acoustic Tracking Array platform, looking at movement and migration of mullet and eels hoping to contribute to the work of Olaf and other local sciences on eels and estuarine ecology. Similarly, Nabuchle Panza has chosen to stay as a SIAB student. She's now doing her PhD, building on her MSc with Olaf on the biology of Oreochromis mozambicus and its vulnerability to the invasion of Oreochromis nyloticus. She also has a very good paper ready to go. Daniel Van Blerk only was awarded his MSc this last week. So he's one of our most recent graduates, which was on the impacts of invasive fish on ghost frog tadpoles. He has one paper in preparation, which we have uh, released as a preprint as his work is now being used to contribute to the current IUCN red list assessment reassessments for his focal study species. Lomary has similarly just completed her MSc in the last week. She studied biological longitudinal aspects of the Kabompo River in uh, Zambia and is now working as a junior researcher at Rivers of Life Aquatic Health Service and has applied to undertake a PhD at the University of Pumalanga. So in addition to a remarkable catalogue of research, Olaf has left a legacy in his academic family tree. To look at just a couple of graduation pictures, here on the left is Leon Barkutsen, who completed his PhD with Olaf and then supervised Peter through his. On the right, Ryan Wasserman, a former postdoc of Olaf's and his MSc supervisee, Buchleum Panzer. I am certain as time passes, this academic family tree will continue to grow. So, Although our captain has sailed off into the sunset, there are many bright young hands still sailing this ship of Olaf's research in inland fisheries and freshwater ecology. And when I asked them what they wanted to say, that the most resounding comment was gratitude gratitude for this chance, gratitude to be part of Olaf's group. And I hope gratitude for the wonderful careers and contribution to science that will continue over the years ahead. Thank you. Thanks to Josie. Um, last but not least um, is that Olaf was not the only doctor fail. Uh, there's a whole plethora of them. Um, but um, the the Vale family will be now speaking just a little bit about the influence of Olaf, um, obviously not just as a son, but um, as an academic as well, um, to his young brother, his baby brother, I think. Um, here we go. You took Olaf's dress sense. <laughs> Thanks, Gus. Uh, thanks, Josie. I was holding it together until you mentioned him sailing off into the into the distance. Um, yeah, so to to say that Olaf had an influence on my life would be an absolute understatement. Um, and it just goes to show with all the talks today that he's had an influence on just about everybody's life that he that he came across. Um, yeah, so just all up in his natural habitat, um, busy cooking. Uh, just he used to get so cross. So if you walked over and he was cooking sushi rice, and you go, oh, "What's that?" <laughs> um, he got so angry. Ex. Anyway, 
Um, so Olaf had an influence on my life from a very early, uh, early stage. And just to start with, um, so as a brother, and uh, he always knew how to work the system. So uh, he started me quite young. Uh, so that's, that's me with two fish in my hands. And he, he always had a plan for everything. You know, what he was trying to do was trying to get me to, to fall in love with fish um, and to carry these around uh, every day. My mom used to have to put them in the freezer in the, in the evening. Um, and the next morning we would have to take them out and, it, you know, the week would go by Monday to Friday, by Friday, the fish start smelling. And, uh, my mom would say, Olaf, get back to the dam and go and catch some more fish and bring them back for your brother. Okay. Um, so you got to go fishing every weekend just to, just to keep me happy, which was, you know, like I said, um, working the system, right. Um, and it also meant that every holiday was spent, uh, catching fish, which was, um, yeah, part of the game. Um, he also had an influence on my life um, as a friend. Um, and again, you, you'll, you'll recognize the, the theme going forward. It's all got to do with fishing, right? Uh, we used to fish tournaments together. We used to do a lot of field work together. Thank you, Gus. Um, yeah, we used to just spend a lot, a lot of time together. Um, and no matter how far away we were, he always made the effort to come and visit. Um, so that's all of uh, visiting me in Switzerland. Um, of course, it has to do with fishing as usual, uh, but not only fishing, uh, he also would uh, give us various presentations followed by uh, cold beer and yeah, the stories go on. Um, he was also an incredible mentor. Um, he helped me publish my first paper, um, which still contributes to his H factor, just by the way. So again, <laughs> working the system. Um, he never missed uh, a single graduation of mine. Um, and we spent many hours uh, discussing various uh, supervisors of masters and PhDs and so on and so forth. Um, he was always there for me um, and guided me through, through my academic career. One thing that was incredibly frustrating going through my academic career was, um, you know, you go to conferences. And yeah, you're sort of sitting there or you're chatting to somebody and you go, oh, so what's your name? Oh, Philip, I feel a vile. Oh, oh geez, you must be Olaf's brother. Hey? <laughs> Man, it, you know, it got to the point where I just every conference I'd go to, I'd go, how's it? I'm Philip, Olaf's brother. And everyone would go, oh, yeah. Okay. And anyway, so eventually I went to one conference. It was a, probably an obscure botany weed biocontrol type conference. And I said, how's it? Yeah, I'm Philip, Olaf's brother. Jeez, who the hell is Olaf, eh? <laughs> so, come here. <laughs> Grab this guy. And I said, listen, when you meet Olaf, because you will, please do me a huge favor. When he says, how's the time, Olaf Vile, say, ah, oh, jeez, you Philip's brother, eh? <laughs> I, have, I have no idea if that ever happened, but man, I hope it did. <laughs> um, he also... You know, um, as as you develop in your career, um, I got a job opportunity in Switzerland, um, and he really pushed me pushed me towards it. I, I really didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave Africa. I didn't want to leave Rhodes. I didn't want to leave um, the CBC. I, I just I, I really had my roots growing here. And he said, "Man, just just go. Just see what it's like. Go and experience life." Um, and it's probably one of the best moves of my career that I've ever made. Um, and I owe my brother for that. Um, I now lead a fantastic team of scientists, um, research technicians, students, and yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do that without him. Yeah, so it breaks my heart to think that we've had our last cast together. Um, it is our last cast, but uh, he is always with me. Um, we are, yeah, molded uh, like two fish. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Phil. And uh, make no mistake, we heard lots about you from him. Um, he was a very proud brother. Now over to Uli. The real boss of the Vale family. It's not the only person that Olaf sort of jumped for a little bit, you know. 
Yeah, amazing, amazing uh, detailed record of Olaf. I didn't know most of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I hear today for the first time also. Um, well, you need to stand up a bit closer, yeah? Oh, yeah, and uh, you know, just take this away from here. Um, and I can see how big the Pishkov family is, uh, because I always refer to one of the Pishkovs. Uh, and uh, Tom, the reason why he went to um, Lake Chikamba was I wanted the, a bus for dinner, because the bus are much nicer than Chambos or the. Yeah. So um, I will talk about a few other things. I didn't really have much contact with Olaf on research. We were, we were miles apart. Yeah. I never realized what he was really doing, and I couldn't understand. When I saw a little bit of his work, I couldn't understand anything. Even when I visited Tom, he failed to enlighten me. We rather had a good drink and a good meal. Um, but only recently I brought things together and um, was very glad that this um, uh, memorial could be organized. And I would like to thank Angus, the Institute, the University, very much for this opportunity and that you gave Olaf over decades, you know, a home, yeah, a frame, yeah, um, contacts, yeah. And uh, I think now what I've seen, I don't think he has disappointed. Yeah, other than Angus. Angus had to clear up, <laughs> which I know because I was for 50 years a develop, program development uh, for the German government in Africa. And we had to be meticulous with accounts and bookkeeping. And uh, if he would have con continued, I would have said, Angus, employ a bookkeeper right on the site <laughs> and don't let him touch any, <laughs> any money. And uh, anyway, you, you know, some of you, and uh, but it didn't do much harm. Yeah. So I will talk about something very different, you know. Um, and you will you will learn about the side of Olaf. I don't think you are aware of. Yeah. Um, so in 1982, I went with my family for a holiday to Lake Kanganika. There's a little beach, there's a hotel, and we were settling down on the beach, and my wife said, um, um, she expects that any father should go out fishing with his 10-year-old son. Oh my gosh, I wasn't interested in fish at all. Sorry, yeah. So <laughs> I had to concede and I got in the boat with a skipper and a rod and this, all this other stuff which I have uh, prepared. I did, after 50 minutes, he kicked me out of the boat with tangled fishing lines, looking at his mother saying, don't you ever do this again. <laughs> Dad is useless for fishing. He had no patience. He tuned around and left back into the lake, coming back later with lots of fishes. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever fished with him. <laughs> um, um, the... Um, Olaf never lost his passion for fishing and fishes. I think that became very clear out of your interaction with him over many, many years inter internationally, regionally, and locally. Yeah. And um, I think this is, this is something unique that somebody can maintain a high level of passion. Yeah? And maybe there was nothing else to talk about. And the TV didn't offer much, you know. Although his, his literature he read was the most horrible books by Gabi Witch book. Some Stephen King, Stephen King yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of you might know it, you know. Um, as he studied fishery science and made his academic career as they have thought, and I'm really thankful to Tom and all the others to give such a very good record yeah, of that um, career, uh, which I'm not going to, and I couldn't repeat. Yeah, um, We were very different subjects apart from each other. He was a natural scientist, fishery. I am a sociologist, development management, and um, advisory services for young people to be prepared for work, yeah, which is more and more difficulty when they graduate and can't find 
any um, employment. Techlige, he is a fishery scientist and myself a social scientist in many aspects, my support ever said, but to my surprise, around 2008, he came to mention he must teach and promote technical understanding and research also in the context of socioeconomic and political dimensions and CBNRT, community-based natural disaster development of the countries and societies where his research and the research of his uh, researchers, students were performed. I had to fill his mind with all this knowledge. And uh, he came to me and said, can you give me all your books on these issues? So I said, yes. And I packed a big trolley and sent it by DHL to um, um, Grahamstown. Yeah? And I think the books must be somewhere around. Yeah? And um, he started to interact also to brand his mind in a much broader way than just the science and uh, related aspects. And um, we had, I mean, so some of you said you had lots of discussions with him. Now came my discussion with him. Now I linked with him. I wasn't thrown out anymore, rejected. Now he wanted me and I wanted him because I was always in Mozambique and all other, other countries working, but in a different field of reconstruction, reintegration of refugees, etc. Now, <clears throat> What I did with him is I went through my literature, which I wrote on socioeconomic and political dimension, now focused on South Africa. My first interaction with him was on a paper I wrote together with Alfred Zoh, who in, in based on a long, long interview in Dar es Salaam during the struggle when the leadership of the ANC was posted in Dar es Salaam, Oliver Tambo, and uh, Alfred Zoh, as even a district here is called Alfred Zoh the district, and I published a long, long interview, which he read. And as some of you said, when he got something he was interested, he read it. And obviously he must have read it very fast because it was 25 pages. Now, the second thing, <clears throat> and I, I met with Alfred Zoe again in connection with the German-South African nuclear collaboration. But I'm not going into that any further. The second thing I, I discussed with him in detail was what I learned from uh, Bayas and Day and Klein, Horst Kleinschnitt and a lot of local um, um, activists in NGOs and political organs. Yeah, And particularly my interest was focused on black consciousness and collective actions and the legitimization of um, um, counter violence against structural violence. Yeah which was a very key issue in South Africa amongst the um, church people, how to justify black theology, yeah, and who learned it actually from German, uh, um, a German priest uh, who was killed by the Nazis in one of the last days before the end, you know, where he went through this man and found the justification to this. And uh, the black consciousness and by and black theology was also interacting with these as to find a legitimization because everything everything which was done in the struggle was terrorism by the West classified. But when independence came, they were friends uh, because of interest now. Uh, so we had long, long discussions, and I told him about my meeting with um, Butelesi on the homeland and this, this useless concept uh, of homelands, you know, separating people from the homeland and herding them into small areas. And that part, the homeless looked like the Swiss, Swiss cheese, you know, and um, that's something. And he took interest and he wanted to know. Yeah. So the other thing, um, I did a long study on labor migration and underdevelopment in Africa, while he was um, focusing on the fisheries thing of graduated mono, and um, which was uh, brought me from the village in Malawi to the mines in South Africa. And it was very interesting, you know, how this developed and how a positive development didn't em emanate out of labor migration, uh, then the exploitation of the labor, yeah. So he was very interested, yeah. 
to what extent he now he wanted to know more. Now we talked more about things, you know, the bureaucratic organization of the ANC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, and uh, I would have discussed with him now the recent development in this country because neo neoliberal economic concepts don't work. This country is in a in a in a crisis, and uh, the crisis has to develop new strategies, um, not only for South Africa but all the poor countries in Africa because they were basically exploited under the neoliberal context and ideology. Yeah. So I don't want to go teach you now politics, but that was my interaction. And uh, with him, uh, it was a, not about fish. So now I had to give him something, but we were still eating a lot of fish in those days. Yeah. So, um, um, but in the, uh, but in the context, we also talked a lot about um, interdisciplinary, yeah, coordinated uh, approaches in research. And um, only recently, when I was sitting down with the director of uh, of fishery in Malawi, yeah, and um, we looked at the situation of the lake and the devastation of the catchment areas. And we both concluded if that is not addressed now, 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 that's the end of the beautiful Lake Malawi's fishery um, potential. Yeah. And it was interesting that we both concluded it needed an interdisciplinary approach to catchment area. That's basically the whole escarpment, yeah, which was deforested and um, there needs something to be done. Yeah. And uh, he sent us actually some materials, which I will now have to give to Josie and others, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> so basically, and there was no more rejection like in 2008. <laughs> uh, a long time, but he always kept a very close relationship to my wife. When he was on conferences in Europe, he threw the suitcase somewhere in the hotel, went to the train station, got a ticket, and he went home, and then he came to the door, I wasn't even there, and he took my wife in her arm, and he, he didn't talk fish, they were playing cards, <laughs> yeah, they were talking about other things, yeah, he was, he could really switch over, but he had his laptop, and at night time, because how else could he have published so much, yeah, and I think the number of papers are interesting, yeah, but I think what is more, uh, more behind this is passionate, is integration of everybody in writing and thinking and researching yeah, and naming them, yeah. And I must say, I enjoyed his special motivation, sharing and caring, yeah. Somebody mentioned it briefly, I think Tom said about, for his research students and worldwide exchange of knowledge with colleagues, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, I told him, be ambitious, but not arrogant. Uh, be available 24 hours for anyone who needs you, support where you are, uh, where you can, and raise resources and funding wherever you can for research and students. And I think there he was quite good, huh, Angus, huh? To pick up, also, to milk some cows, huh? To me, I was also very good. I had always multi-finance programs. Yeah. Anyway, he was quite successful in that. And... Uh, when I was with the director of a fishery and, and sitting on the beach in, in Monkey Bay, okay, uh, and then he said to me, I didn't do the PhD in here in, in America, but when I prepared my um, MS, my master degree, Olaf assisted me to set up a good concept paper, which then succeeded that he could, uh, could get some financing. Yeah. Um, uh, because Malawi students need financing for their livelihood as well, yeah. <clears throat> but then came the blow into my heart, and all of a sudden I lost him. But then I learned that his legacy now, passionate and commitment continued with many of his students, and I think this was a witness and demonstrated very, very lively and, uh, and understandably, yeah. That was a... <laughs> And um, students who implanted, I think, a lot of his values and capacities he built and careers promoted. 
So I have to thank, as I said before, specifically all those who were with him and particularly the Zayab. I mean, you are like a family, you know? You are so different from German institutes where people go in and out, they don't talk, and there's no linking of people, bringing them together and so on. But I think fishery, the fish crops are a special <laughs> type of people. So thank you very much. And uh, also for your attention to me and to all the other presenters. Tom? Only 20 minutes late, very surprising. We had so much to say about Olaf. Um, the vice chancellor leaned over to me and said, you know, this is so rich. Um, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's about really celebrating an outstanding academic, um, an outstanding friend, uh, someone who drove the transformation mandate, someone who, yeah, he was just special. I look around the, the floor here today and all of the colleagues overseas, and this is exactly what I wanted. It's exactly what uh, the family wanted. I think everyone needed a chance just to recognize who Olive was um, and the immense role that he has. His DNA is deeply embedded in Saeb as it is in DIFFS. You'll see that little tete -a -tete Tom and I were having between where the Saeb or, or DIFFS came first, you know what I mean? So um, um, the, yeah, Olaf is always here. Um, and, and I think it will go on in the legacy of his students and his students. And there will be the stories. What is really good is, is that his stories are really big, but you know, with time, stories get embellished. So I can't wait to hear the stories by 2040. Um, <laughs> Olaf will be a bigger, a bigger figure even then. Um, we have gone over time. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, of course, questions can be sent um, to me or to the family as well, but we do have time for maybe one or two. Pete? Just a, a greeting from the uh, Yellow Fish Working Group of the Federation of Fly Fishing in South Africa, who are supported with science based advice and they um, advocate and uh, passionate about the environment and take up their causes. Their, uh, thoughts and, and, gratitude. and that's from the Yellowfish Working Group. Um, thanks very much, Pete. Any other questions? If not, there are tea and coffee. Thanks to everyone um, I see on the board here um, from all over South Africa and international. Um, let's keep up the collaborations. Uh, let's keep Olaf's work going. Um, and let's um, remember the special man as he was. Thanks very much. And not to um, leave anything, thanks so much to Lucky and his team for organizing all of this um, first-rate job, um, and also to the, um, the foundation um, for all of their work as well. So thanks for them and to those of you that traveled. Um, thank you very much. There is tea and coffee too here. Yeah, uh, they do that. Huh?